from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And coming up today from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Tyler Cousins is featured on this week's cattle market segment. In addition to commenting on the recent fed and feeder cattle price trends, Tyler will draw from the LMIC's new outlook on beef demand. Then K-State's Sandy Johnson will talk about evaluating the performance of bulls during this latest breeding season saying that you producers can gain a lot from reassessing individual bull breeding success. Later, from the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, a look at several facets of a successful pre-weaning conditioning program for those beef calves. Also today, this week's 4-H segment. All that coming up on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're listening to the Monday edition of Agriculture Today. Once more, thanks for tuning in. First, our cattle market segment for this week, and we will cover in the next few moments good information on meat demand in the U.S., of course, including beef, pulled together by our guest and his colleagues at the Livestock Marketing Information Center out in Denver, which is a project, of course, co-sponsored by Kansas State University. We're talking now with LMIC agricultural economist Tyler Cousins. Good to have you aboard, Tyler. Before we get into this analysis that you put together, let's quickly look back at fed and feeder cattle price trends, starting with feeders, which if one looks at this from a a wide perspective, it's been a pretty decent improvement in this market over the last several weeks. Yes, it has. And, uh, you know, I think if we kind of look at Southern Plain feeder cattle prices, the five to 600 pound steer price from January to August, uh, it's been averaging about $159 per hundredweight. Uh, but interestingly, in August, you know, the average price was uh, nearly $162 uh, per hundredweight. And this is the highest monthly average since the pandemic started back in March. Um, you know, and we typically don't see uh, prices for that five to 600 pound uh, steers uh, strengthen there in August. Um, typically, we'll see a decline from about July to October with prices in the fourth quarter lower than the first half of the year. Um, these lower prices are due to cows being born in the spring and weaned in the fall, which creates a larger supply of market-ready steers uh, during the second half of the year, which typically will pressure prices. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, 2020 hasn't been a normal year. Cattle production has been interrupted by this pandemic. Uh, cattle flows have, have uh, been disrupted between kind of cow-calf operations, stalkers, backgrounding operations, and feedlots. You know, so that that's kind of changed the flows here. And so uh, one thing to kind of look for and watch here is, is what's going to kind of happen as we get into these these placement months here. Specifically, there's been some yearlings that might be bunched up on summer grazing programs um, that could potentially dampen uh, prices for that seven to eight hundred pound feeder steer price, and that could also spill into pressuring prices on that five hundred six hundred pound steer uh, as well. So another thing to watch here in these coming months, you know, we, we've seen quite a bit of dryness. Uh, and heat here in the western U.S., and that can play a role into just available pasture on just feed supplies, and that can change some of these flow of these cattle um, as we go into these placement months here. You know, we're we're getting into the early start of wheat planting here in some of those grazing areas and uh, what's going to shape up with that and just uh, available supplies there and if they'll get any rain. So those are some things to be watching here in these coming months. The fed cattle price side, we've seen a string of weeks now where it has retreated. Last week was no exception. It was, yeah. You know, and I think it's interesting to see that, you know, in mid-August, we saw those prices uh, rise just over uh, $106 per hundred weight. You know, and and as you mentioned, in these these last couple weeks, we've been in the mid to kind of low $100 per hundred weight range here. But I think, you know, this week, we specifically, uh, as we finished out this week, we saw some of those fed prices in the $102 range, 
which I think is a good sign. You know, I, I'm hoping that next week we'll see a similar trend um, as prices being above that $100 mark there. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. And to see a little bit of strength, especially this time of year, in that Fed price, I think is good because we're going into those months where Fed prices can dip in, in September and October. Um, so to see some improvement, this is a, uh, I think it's a good pattern to uh, see here. So we'll see what shapes up here. Um, but LMIC, we have the five area Fed price forecast at about 108 to 110 dollars in the fourth quarter, with an annual average of about 107 to 109 dollars per hundred weight this year. So that would be indicative of at least modest improvement going forward here in the fourth quarter. Uh, let's look for that. Tyler, we uh, now are past the Labor Day holiday, and that's often used as a benchmark for domestic beef demand. Uh, folks always wonder what will happen once that holiday has come and gone in our domestic demand trends. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting question and to kind of watch play out here. You know, we, we saw sort of that typical ramp up in uh, box beef prices there and that cutout leading up to Labor Day. You know, and as we get post Labor Day here and see what happens, I think a lot of it will kind of depend on on just consumer confidence uh, with the pandemic uh, as they get into more of a routine with school and kids and so forth, and just general participation in the restaurant sector. What's going to happen on the restaurant side? Will we see some improvement? People dining out. That will definitely start to shape the picture for beef demand. Uh, as we move into uh, finishing the third quarter and going into the fourth quarter here. Uh, and one of the things that I've kind of pulled out that is a little bit interesting is uh, there's a website called opentable.com. And so actually it's an online reservation service is what it does. But they make their data available to daily seated diners for online phone and lock-in reservations. And I think that gives an interesting picture of what is kind of going on nationally. Because what we've seen nationally is we've seen sort of these reservations for dining start to increase, especially in May, and we've seen a general upward trend. Now, it still is below last year, but we're seeing this trend increasing, which I think is definitely a good sign that we're seeing consumers get a little bit more confidence to venture out and uh, go to restaurants, which is definitely good for beef demand. Um, but I think if you look at that is definitely dependent regionally and even state and city level, because if you look at cities like New York City and Los Angeles, where the pandemic has been a little bit more of an impact, reservations are still well below uh, last year and the national level. So I think it, it's not representative of all of the restaurant sector, but I think it gives us an idea of what's going on, which then we can sort of extrapolate into potential impacts to beat demand, uh, especially going through 2020 uh, and potentially in the start of 2021. And there are so many abnormalities created by the pandemic. And, and will we see a return to normal consumption behavior, the restaurants included? So lots of questions still out there about this, Tyler. Yes, yes, a lot of questions. You know, and I think just what's going to happen on the res restaurant sector and potentially permanent changes to consumer behaviors. You know, will they be less likely to dine out? Will they be purchasing more uh, from grocery stores and trying to create their own beef experience at home? You know, because definitely the, the beef experience is tied to going to a restaurant. So I think those are things that are definitely going to play out. But I think, you know, a lot of the meat sector, uh, specifically beef, they can pivot quite well to meet these changes in uh, consumer demands. And that leads us right into something else that you at the LMIC have pulled together recently, the Center's Red Meat and Poultry Outlook, and uh, factoring in there, of course, the pandemic trends. When we consider beef, what are some of the observations you've made in this analysis? Yeah, so looking at beef, you know, prior to the pandemic, slaughter was doing quite well and easily above prior year levels. Uh, but once the pandemic hit, We've seen a uh, decline here in federally inspected cattle slaughter, and actually since April, only three weeks have managed to be above last year. But we're starting to see some more of these recent weeks get closer to prior year levels, which I think is a good sign. We're seeing the industry get back on its feet and slaughter levels get back to where they should be to, to potentially work through this backlog of cattle that we've seen on, in the supply chain here. But I think one of the interesting things to, to pull out from that is if we look at dress weights, uh, we've seen a jump in dress weights here, uh, especially over the summer, and, and actually dress weights have been up all year. 
Uh, specifically, you know, in, in mid-May, steer dress weights were as much as 52 pounds higher than the same length a year ago. You know, and, e- and even last week, they were, they were 32 pounds higher uh, than the prior year, right? So we, we see this, even though we've seen a little bit of a sluggish side to the federally inspected cattle slaughter, we're seeing a boost in these dress weights, which is helping to fuel this beef production. Uh, and so the beef sector is, is doing quite well to, to uh, meet potential supply needs and, and changes in consumer demand and preferences. And uh, LMIC is actually forecasting 2020 commercial cattle slaughter down 2% this year, but beef production will actually be flat because of that boost in, in uh, dressed weight. So this higher beef production coupled with slow beef demand in the restaurant sector is pressure the choice beef box cut out value a little prior year and much much lower than the record highs that we saw in May. So I think that's definitely something to keep an eye on as we move forward with the demand, uh, especially in the near term, uh, and just what's going to happen with the restaurant sector. And as you were saying earlier, there are, are so many unknowns regarding that right now. So there are all kinds of dynamics that could still play out and affect this demand scenario. There are, there are, you know, and I think if we kind of look at some of the potential factors that could play out on the beef demand side of things, you know, as I mentioned, some of this just uh, consumers may be experimenting a little bit more and having their, creating their own beef experience at home. And how does this change as far as preferences and how they purchase beef uh, at the grocery store? You know, and so if we tie that into but also factoring in what happens as far as the restaurant sector, depending what what changes with consumer preferences, that can affect some of these middle meats, the steaks that we're looking at here. And and if that starts to struggle, that can start to impact the cutout value. And all of this is captured in this red meat and poultry outlook. The LMIC.info website has that for review. Tyler, thank you very much for sharing the thoughts right here. We will catch up with you again on down the line. Thank you. Tyler Cousins with us from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, where he's an agricultural economist on the LMIC staff. Again, check this out and much more at that website, lmic.info. You're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. And the next few moments for you cow-calf producers, as you assess your just finished breeding season for your herds, and that's been a couple of months back now for many of you, but you're now coming to the understanding of how successful you might have been with the breeding program. And our guest now is suggesting not only to focus on the females and how well they've done, whether they've settled or not, but also the performance of those sires. Sandy Johnson is with us. She's a beef reproduction specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Just asking, Sandy, do the bulls tend to often get overlooked when one attempts to get a handle on their herd breeding success this last go-round? Well, you know, Eric, I think our biggest problem getting cows bred is often the nutrition of the cow. So that's certainly the first place we look. But you know, it's a, a two-part equation, and so, you know, sometimes we know, well, things could be a little iffy this year, and other times we don't know until we preg those cows up what's what's going on, and, you know, there's probably times when there's contributions on both sides of the equation, and uh, when we get to that point where this is totally unacceptable, we need to know what's wrong, we want to f- focus on understanding what things we need to think about on the bull side of that equation to try and make sure it doesn't happen again. And we'll pick through some possibilities here, but what is that telltale point at which one has to consider that something hasn't gone right, and and as far as pregnancy rates go? Right. Well, you know, we all pretty much sure if it's like a 60% pregnancy rate, we're, we're not very happy. But 
We have a little bit of benchmark data that comes from the North Dakota CHAPS uh, database. Uh, in that database, their average season-long pregnancy rate is just a little under 94%. And based on what they show for calving distributions, most of those would have at least a 60-day breeding period and some probably longer than that. And we shouldn't deceive ourselves in thinking that a longer breeding season and it's always the way to a higher pregnancy rate. But I think well-managed herds do hit that target of about 90, 93%. And we could work through some numbers that kind of support that. But, you know, that that's certainly a good, good target. And, you know, the other thing to keep in mind as we're thinking about pregnancy rates in general is that if you're striving for a 100% pregnancy rate, I would argue that you can't. If you are in the beef business for an economic reason, that you can't afford to probably feed enough for that. Plus, there's always going to be some failure. I mean, that's just nature. So mm-hmm. what we want to do is understand, okay, here's here's a good target but follow our progress from year to year because some of the things that can happen to herds, they might be showing some gradual decline and then take a big drop. Hmm. And that might happen with something like trick. And if you weren't following that over time, you might not look for anything until you got that big drop and slap in the face. Right. And nobody wants to let it go that far. But if one is falling short on those pregnancy rate targets, what can tangibly then, Sandy, be tied back to bull performance? Right. You know, and the, there's a number of things, and when we get these questions, I think sometimes producers get frustrated when we go through these list of questions because I think normally they intend to do all these things. But sometimes it doesn't always happen that way. And until you start asking questions, you don't learn where those, well, this year this happened. But the thing we want to make sure we always do is turn out bulls that we know have uh, passed a breeding soundness exam. And we need to make sure that exam includes a palpation examination of the, you know, structure, eyes, whole physical evaluation as well as the semen evaluation. You know, in our heads, I think sometimes it's just the semen, and that's a very important part, but it takes all of those to complete that exam. And and so that's our foundation. And if that bull passed with flying colors as opposed to barely eking by in that examination, is that something to think about here, Sandy? Well, you know, it's a piece of information that might help you if you are troubleshooting. Depending on if it's a yearling bull or a mature bull, you know, fertility, bull fertility is not a static trait. It changes over time. What you don't know on that borderline bull is, is he getting better or getting worse if you've only tested him once? And so, you know, one of your approaches might be to make sure to put that bull with a bull that uh, tested really well is trying to hedge your bed. But that doesn't necessarily help you if the bull with borderline passing is also the dominant bull and might be covering most of the cows. So, that, you know, there's a, a variety of factors at play there. Can the bull's actual breeding condition change over the course of that breeding season, whatever it might be, 60 days or so? Is that something to factor in here? Yes, bull conditions certainly can change, and, you know, particularly on young bulls, if they came off kind of a hot ration, and they often decline not only because they're working hard as they're learning that first season, and, you know, depending on how they were developed, you know, they may need to be relearning to graze, plus the whole uh, new thing of of, uh, the work they're doing. And so we want certainly enough condition to plan for them to lose some, but we need to be aware that a little is okay, but there's a line when it's too much. And, you know, one of the things that's easy for us to do now, because most everybody's carrying a phone around that's got a camera, and when you dump those bulls out or turn them out, snap a picture, it can help you know what bulls you put where as a record, and this is what their condition was. And then, uh, you know, if there's a question later, you know, sometimes we don't, if we're looking at animals 
all the time, we don't notice a gradual change in, in body condition. And so that can serve as a reference point for us, too, if, if we come to question that. Good suggestion there. How about managing bull numbers themselves? And especially where you have more than one bull in a given pasture and whether the balance of service, if you will, is sufficient here. Something to think about as well? Right. You know, and this is an area I really wish we had more hard data to support what we recommend. But, you know, our typical rule of thumb for uh, bulls under three years of age is no more females to one bull than his age in months. So if it's a 13-month-old bull, you know, 13 females is plenty of load for that bull. And, you know, we want to think about those breeding groups and try and avoid putting uh, mixed ages together because then, you know, we've got increased dominance effects and then trying to have bulls that we want the any pecking order established before we turn them out. So they need to be together before they go out. So that, that part is over uh, as much as possible. We always say adjusted for pasture size and train. And quite frankly, I don't have any really great firm research that says for this or that, you know, adjust up or down. And I just always think about this, one sheep study where they tethered the ram in one place and all the ewes got bred. And I wish I could repeat that for cattle and hmm. see what happens. But or, the, the point is just be sure to not overtax that bull to female ratio. That's the essence of it, right? Right. And, and you know, there's a fine line in terms of profitable production. You know, you, you don't want to overkill there, but if if you don't have a a fertile bull out there, that's really expensive. So have to find something that is uh, middle of the road and gets the job done. Well, we've spoken in our short time here about a selection of things, but these are only part of an overall assessment of one's herd breeding program just passed. And producers need to account for a lot of other variables too, don't they, Sandy? Right. You know, we just have to look at each step and things that might potentially go wrong if we're trying to troubleshoot undesirable pregnancy response. And so there's always a, a chance that we intended to do something. And, oh, I guess that was actually last year we did that, <laughs> not this year. And now maybe that doesn't happen to you, Eric, but I noticed <laughs> that uh, those types of thoughts go through my mind more these days than they used to. So yeah. hopefully not for our producers, though. Indeed. By the way, Sandy has, in fact, put together an article on the topic we're talking here, the role of the bull in poor pregnancy outcomes. That is included in the most recent Beef Tips newsletter out of the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at K-State. You can find that at ksubeef.org, by the way. Thanks for the input, Sandy. Always a pleasure to talk with you, and we'll catch up again soon. Thanks. Pleased to be here. That's Sandy Johnson, a beef reproduction specialist for K-State Research and Extension. Sandy is based in northwest Kansas. You are tuned into Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today is back here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. Well, we're into another highly important stage of management for you cow-calf producers running a spring calving program, weaning time. And as research and experience has shown for some time now, there's great value in putting those calves through a preconditioning program ahead of weaning. And that was one of the subjects of choice during a recent Cattle Chat podcast put out by the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. Joining the Institute's director, K-State veterinarian Brad White, our fellow veterinarian Bob Larson, and cow-calf specialist Bob Weber. 
we, we think about preconditioning and, and Bob and Bob, give yeah. me a definition. You get one sentence. What is preconditioning to you? I'm going to focus on the health side because I think there's a health and then a, you know, a transition for good performance. And I'll let Weber handle the good performance side. I'm going to say from a health standpoint, I want to prepare that calf so he's well vaccinated and has a good immune response. And that means vaccinations, low stress, and removal of parasite load. Weber? Uh, I'm going to say just prepare the calf for the next event in its life. Okay. I like that. And we know, even based on some of the numbers that we just discussed, that he's going to be vaccinated when he enters the feed yard. And he's likely to be castrated when he comes into the feed yard if he comes in a bull. So those are two big things that will occur. But if we can prep him before, and I want to dive into the vaccinations a little bit, Bob, and I'll ask you, how long does it take, if I vaccinate a calf today, how long does it take to stimulate some immunity? Well, it does depend a little bit on which, you know, germ we're really talking about here. But, you know, the typical viruses that cause respiratory disease, IBR, BVD, PI3, some of those, we talk about getting our peak protection out here three weeks or so after the vaccine. That's one of the concepts with a preconditioning is to rather than to vaccinate right when that risk starts at feedlot arrival or start at arrival at a background there to move that back a few weeks. You know, if I can get that a month ahead or something, then then that calf is really the timing is better. And so his peak immunity is really aligned better with when he's, you know, commingled with other calves, spend some time on a truck, those types of things. Because the body's got to respond to it. So yeah. give me a vaccine this morning and expose me to disease this afternoon. The vaccine has no shot. Right? Yeah, it's, not, right. it's not going to help. And so the concept of preconditioning and, and what Weber said earlier is get that, get that in a little bit earlier because I'm preparing him for his next phase of life. And his next phase of life means he's meeting new calves mm -hmm. right? In, in almost all circumstances. And Weber, what is that? Uh, when you think about that, that kind of commingling aspect, what does that make you think about relative to preconditioning? I think, you know, Larson's uh, in your comments on, on, on the vaccination points are really good. You got to get it in them uh, well in advance so they've got an opportunity to mount some defense against what we anticipate them uh, seeing as they, they move into that commingling bit. And, you know, I think we, we talk a lot about commingling, but it's, it's particularly for small producers and, and higher risk calves, you know, I think it's, it's a very common practice to obviously sell calves at weaning time through a sale barn. If you sell them in small groups, they're going to get commingled probably that day at the sale barn as, as they go into sort groups uh, by buyer aggregated on a semi truck. So the likelihood they're standing next to, you know, their five cohorts that they showed up at the place with is almost zero. Um, so, you know, they're already in a high stress environment and transportation and uh, commingling and you know, all the new sights and sounds that they've not experienced before. And then delivered to some place, maybe hours and hours away. You know, anything we can do to to sort of help uh, manage uh, and and make immune function resilient to that, uh, I think is really helpful because the, the commingling presents a uh, you know, obviously exposure potential exposure to to novel um, variants of a variety of pathogens, and they got to be ready for that. Yeah. So, yeah, so we stimulate that immunity prior to the challenge, but you also bring up a, a good point that I want you to follow up on briefly is. When you think about those cattle going to that new environment, what, what are some of the other changes that they've got besides just who they're exposed to? Well, sure. Uh, diet, obviously. Um, and in fact, you know, there's, uh, depending, you know, if they're going to, if they're going to wheat pasture, that's a pretty innocuous maybe change for a group of calves that are going to you know, maybe Oklahoma or Southern Kansas for a winter grazing period. But, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of those calves show up uh, at a commercial feed yard or backgrounding yard and they're on a new diet and, new pen conditions, new water source, you know, basically everything's new. So um, you know, having um, some other behaviors reinforced in those calves, like have you confined them before? Are they bunk broke? Do they know how to go find a water trough? And three or four days of not doing either eating or drinking uh, usually leads to, to some bad outcomes. So, Yeah, and the vaccines are an important part of preparing calves for the next phase. But it's really about preparing the immune system, getting the immune system ready. So the vaccines are important. But if those calves, you know, are dehydrated, not eating well, my vaccines aren't going to work very well. If they've got a really heavy parasite load, they're not 
they're not going to work as well. So it's, you can't just say that preconditioning is the vaccines. It's really the vaccines are just one part of preparing the immune system. So good diet, ability to find and, and drink water. Again, they're used to drinking usually at their feet level, you know, ponds or, or a, a creek or something like that. And now we're moving it up to a tank or something like that. And so they've got to be able to find it and find that bunk and get started on feed. And so, yes, the vaccines are important, but if I don't take care of everything else, the vaccines aren't going to really prepare that calf's immune system. And, and if I'm weaning them on the farm, the more of those adjustments I can make prior to weaning, get rid of the parasites, manage their nutritional needs, minimize that stress, and stimulate immunity, the better chance I'm going to have. So I, th I think those are some of the things that we think about relative to preconditioning. And that leads us to our BCI Cattle Chat checklist for this week, which is our top preventative health tips for pre-weaned calves. Number six, kill parasites so that the cattle are more healthy. Number five, prepare the calves for their new environment, including water and feed bunk. Number four, manage the nutritional needs of your calves. Number three, minimize stressors prior to weaning. Number two, Stimulate immunity through vaccination to match the disease challenges that those calves are going to face. And number one, create a comprehensive plan for understanding uh, your pre-weaning activities and make sure they all fit together and mesh nicely. And those are our top preventative health tips for pre-weaned beef calves. K-State's Bob Weber, Bob Larson, and Brad White. We always encourage you to catch the entire BCI Cattle Chat podcast. It's posted for your listening at ksubci.org. Once more, that's ksubci.org. Jeff Wickman will be in with this week's 4-H segment for you next on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. Leadership is a cornerstone of Kansas 4-H, and youth between the ages of 14 and 18 before January 1st of next year have an opportunity to build on their leadership skills through workshops, consulting groups, and inspirational speakers at this year's Kansas Youth Leadership Forum. The forum, which also includes electing members for the 2021 State 4-H Youth Leadership Council, is being held November 21st and 22nd. Southeast Area Kansas 4-H Youth Development Special Specialist Beth Hinshaw says that this year's event, like so many others, will be conducted virtually. Well, Beth, we're making some progress in certain areas in regard to face-to-face -face interaction, but the Youth Leadership Forum, which is held in November, will be an online event this year, just out of safety precaution. Yes, our Kansas Youth Leadership Forum will be held Saturday, November 21st and Sunday, November 22nd, but it will be virtual this year. Anybody who knows or remembers things about the Leadership Forum knows that we typically would have been at Rock Springs 4-H Center, and gosh, we hope that we can do that in 2021, but for this year, we are going virtual. Now, we know that you can't be virtual the same amount of time that we would have been if we would have been at Rock Springs, and so we're going to have a Saturday session from 9 to noon another Saturday session from 1.45 to 4, and then a Sunday session 1.30 to 4.30. So very different timing this year, but we still think some important things can happen in that time. Well, that's right, because you can still do a lot of the same things that you would do. You're just going to probably have to condense things, compact it just a little bit. Yes, that's exactly what we're doing is we're kind of making things a little shorter. We, you know, we typically would have had three workshops. We're only going to have two we might have had an opportunity to hear from a speaker three times. That'll probably only happen one time this year. So, you know, it's been an opportunity to look at it in a very new way. And I've, I've been really so proud of our youth council members who 
are the ones who organize the Kansas Youth Leadership Forum and in uh, really trying to work through, you know, well, what can we do, you know, and, and how can we make a difference? So, and that's what we're working on right now with the planning of this event. We talk about a learning event right there, just taking it from an actual in-person event to a digital event. They're going to learn a lot from doing that. Yes. And, you know, our young people have had lots of digital experience this year. And so that's really good for us because they know what's been good and they know what's not been good. And so we really, you know, appreciate that insight that they have. Now, will you be able to increase numbers because you're going digital or will it still be about the same size? You know, we'll take anybody who registers, but it's hard to say if it'll be a larger group or a smaller group at this point. But definitely, I think while we don't have the final registration set, it will be a lot more economical to stay at home and go to the forum. So, you know, from that standpoint, I hope we have some more young people join us. Now, talk about some of the things that they learn through this leadership forum. You know, we always have some great workshops. And I'm just, I'm always impressed every year with the kinds of things that people are willing to, you know, share with our young people. And and this year, it's kind of fun. You know, we've got a possibility of having workshops from people who would never probably make the trip to Kansas or, or to Rock Springs in November. So that's kind of exciting. And those are, you know, all kinds of different leadership type ideas. You know, maybe it's about time management. Maybe it's about leadership in your future. Maybe it's about your communication skills and how to use your resources better or leadership after high school, citizenship, diversity, professionalism, business etiquette, conflict management, character, any of those things that are going to help them be better leaders. Now, I imagine you would probably break down into smaller groups originally. Will you still try and do that as well? You know, we're going to have a variety of things that happen in our virtual forum, and there will be some things where we're all together, and then there'll be some smaller type groups. And we would have had that at the forum in person as well, where the youth council leads that group. And that's, you know, an opportunity to get acquainted and, you know, learn about people and places across the state. And then there'll certainly be times where, you know, maybe we're all together for a speaker or some announcements, that kind of thing. And then certainly the workshops will be smaller opportunities where you'll, you know, log in directly to that workshop. Yeah, I've been on some Zooms where you go into a different room and then you come back as a big, large group and discuss what everybody has been talking about and share your thoughts. And that's really kind of a fun way to do things. Yes, and we know that that interaction and and finding ways to build that in when we're not in person are so important. You know, it kind of gets back to our experiential learning model that we talk about in Kansas 4-H, and that is, you know, we do something, we reflect on it, we apply it. Well, those kinds of things work when we can have an opportunity to talk with others about what it is that we've done and how we might apply what happened. This will not only help them in terms of 4-H, this will also help them in terms of everyday life as they learn these leadership skills? Definitely. And, you know, the world needs more leaders. And that's what we're, we're working on in Kansas 4-H is, is we always want to help young people be building the leadership skills so that they can be leaders today and that they can be leaders in the future. And there are some statewide positions available as well as part of this? Yes. One of the hallmarks of the Kansas Youth Leadership Forum is our election of our Kansas 4-H Youth Leadership Council. And so that will happen virtually as well. And it's great that we have this time to chat about this now because our deadline for young people to apply is Monday, September the 21st. So all of the information is up on our state 4-H website. There's a link right from the front page, kansas4h.org. And the Youth Council is for young people who are ages 14 to 18 as of January 1 of 2021. And those who are 15 to 18 could actually apply to attend national conference as well. The young people who attend National Conference actually get a two-year term on the Youth Council, and those who are representatives to the Youth Council have a one-year term. 
So there's kind of two different opportunities, but it's the same application. That's Southeast Area Kansas 4-H Youth Development Specialist Beth Hinshaw. Again, this year's Kansas Youth Leadership Forum is being conducted virtually November 21st and 22nd. Additional information, including registration for the forum, is available online at kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.